and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I am Danny Simmons, and I am thrilled to present to all of you today our brother Dan Gatlin. Uh, this podcast is coming to you from Kerrville, Texas, where Dan Gatlin is a preacher. He has preached for 41 years. He is currently laboring with the Junction Highway Church of Christ in Kerrville, Texas. Uh, Dan told me that he's been here for 22 years. Uh, he's also served as an elder, and I think that's important when we introduce, especially a, a guest who's coming in to sit with us, that uh, Dan has sat in a position of an elder for four years in Kerrville, and uh, and there's there's to me there's a deeper level of of understanding and, and just earnest praying about situations, the challenge to make uh, big and sometimes very difficult decisions falls at the feet of the elders, and so I know that's a challenge, but that also helps us as listeners to know who it is that we're talking to today and, and the great benefit we have uh, to have him here with us now. So thank you, Dan for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm, I'm excited about this. What I did is I asked Dan before coming to Kerrville uh, if he had a topic he was interested in. And so he took a little bit of time and landed on Daniel. Mm -hmm. Daniel's a study that you had been doing just previously and, and one that you were excited about. So I think that's always a really, really good start um, when we're having a conversation, some, something you're interested in. And so is there any introduction things about Daniel before we get moving? Well, other than, you know, it, it's it's one of my favorite Old Testament books because it has something for everybody. You know, we teach our youngest children certain stories in Daniel, but that's not to say that it's a child's book. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say even those stories are only for children. There's a lot for all of us to learn. And when you look at the scope of Daniel, from the first chapter all the way through, there you you have not only milk for young people but there is meat for christians for those of us who've been in the faith for a long time absolutely it is a phenomenal book it really is and you know we end up saying that looking at any particular scripture it's god's word it's alive uh, and it speaks to us in a very personal way, but but you are absolutely yeah. right. We should not think of Daniel as well. It's just the lion's den story, and then we move on. That is not true. So so Daniel is a young man who has devoted himself to God at an early age, which is why I think we're kind of drawn to sharing that with young people, the challenges they face. But the reality is, almost all that we know about Daniel is found in the book of Daniel. Um, and, and as we look at that and the way he's introduced to us. Uh, we know he's very young, possibly in his teens, when he's taken into Babylonian captivity. He, he will be in the first deportation as the Jews are brought out of Israel and, and into Babylonian captivity. Uh, we believe him to be very young, somewhat because in Daniel chapter 1 it says that they were children. They were young, very young men. That, that, mm -hmm. That's revealed to us. But when you take the timeline that we look at in the book of Daniel... He's there when the captivity comes to an end. Uh, right. He says, I, I knew by reading from the prophet Jeremiah, the 70 years had come to an end. So if that's 70 years that he's in captivity, he's got to be between 13 and 16, potentially, uh, from our best guess. So uh, he, he's, he's less than 20. That's safe to say. Yes. I, I, I think yes. that's safe to say. So, so let's, let's move into this. Let's look at Daniel chapter 1. I'll read the first seven verses, and then we'll ask you to talk to us a little bit about that. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Asphanaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the, the men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. I missed there. It was the four young men that they had brought in for that. Verse 5, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah 
Abednego. So that's Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Yeah, and oftentimes what conquerors would do is they would take from the royal families of the nations they conquered, they would take those young people as more or less trophies to, uh, to demonstrate the superiority of their kingdom and their gods over the gods and the kingdoms that they had, uh, that they had just taken. And so from that, we can uh, uh, discern that Daniel was of the royal line That's somewhere, right. somehow. That's right. They're of the tribe of Judah. That's made mm-hmm. clear. And they are, it's of, they are of the royal line. Something else I was thinking about was that when you conquer a nation, as you said, these, these, these young people are trophies. They're taking them right out of the home of royalty, and they're saying, you belong to us now. But I, I've also realized that when you leave a king, which at least at this point, Jehoiakim left there, that when you take his kids, he's more likely to behave, right? Right. If someone takes right. your teenage boys from you, I mean, just think about what that would have meant to the nation. Uh, they have more control over what they will and won't do um, from that distance because they have his, his young men uh, in, in their power. So like you said, they're, they're trophies, no doubt about it. And he is Daniel's part of that royal line. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's not only people that he took. He took the treasure from the temple. And that comes into play later on in the book where they're brought out and there's a consequence for that. <laughs> That's right. But, uh, you know, those things were taken. And again, as, as trophies to show the superiority of, uh, of their God. And there was sort of this mentality, and you see it with the king of Assyria years earlier when they surrounded Jerusalem. The argument is made that if I conquer you, that means my God is greater than your God. And so that's a powerful argument, other than the fact that what they didn't calculate into that was... The fact that God was punishing his own people. That's right. God is involved and he's moving. Yeah. Yeah. So that Daniel, his friends, they're going to have to learn a new language. Uh, They're going to have to learn the literature of the Chaldeans. Um, There's some other challenges now that are going to be set before them. uh, Like the king wants them to eat particular things. And that becomes a problem. For Daniel and his friends, because what we learn is that while the nation as a whole is unfaithful to God, there was still a remnant within the nation, and Daniel and his friends are part of that remnant who just would not be unfaithful to God. They were determined that they were not going to compromise their faith. That's right, which is huge for boys that age, that that young, yes. and to be dragged off to a foreign country. I mean. You're brought into a land that knows nothing of your God. And everything you've learned and understood was that who God was. And as you said, God of Israel, the God of his people, the question that a young person or even the oldest person would have, would, why would God, if we're his people and he cares for us the way he said that he has, why, why would he let all of this happen? And we know why. Mm-hmm. You and I know why. But for a young boy being drug off to a foreign country uh, and then to be trained and taught in their ways, that must be a lingering question. What a challenge to their faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so our kids too, you know, they face things that are similar to that. They're, they are in a foreign land where pilgrims passing through. Mm -hmm. And so that challenge is set there before them as well. So in verse eight, it says, but Daniel. And I, I think if there's, if there was one way to define the book of Daniel, I would define it by, but Daniel. Right. Because it's always, and it's not just in this chapter, is it? It's just, it's always, uh, the the nation was told to, that they couldn't pray. They couldn't pray to their God. Or there was a new decree, but Daniel. You know, yes. He, there's going to be some times. Now, he seems to accept the change of his own name. That's not a violation of God's will. It's, right. Uh, they're going to be given new garments to wear. Not a violation of God's will. But when we get into this conversation about, now you're going to eat these foods and drink this wine. Now we've got a problem, and it's a spiritual battle, isn't it? Yes. It's not. Uh, it's not an earthly. Well, no, I don't, I'm not sure about this because my mama said no, no. This is a spiritual battle. So verse eight. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. 
Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And of course, you might look at that and say, well, what's wrong with the king's delicacies? And there's at least a couple of possibilities. One is that it was in violation to what the law of Moses said. The law of Moses made a clear distinction between clean and unclean animals. And the Jews were not to eat those animals designated as unclean. And Daniel, being a devout uh, Jew, simply would not compromise in that way. Or it may have been that these were animals that had been sacrificed to false gods, mm. where again, you have the same dedication showing itself. He's not going to participate in idolatry in any way, shape, or form. So he, he, he as we're gonna see a little bit later, he has a plan but he's not going to compromise his faith, which is we might look at that and say it's very unusual for someone of such a young age. But there are other young men throughout the scriptures that have the same dedication and the same faithfulness to God. And Daniel and his three friends are certainly numbered among them. Absolutely. It's such an amazing moment as, as we are able to peek in and look at his life. So let me ask you, because he's come in and out to this foreign land, um, we, we've, we've kind of set the stage. They're going to be taught and instructed, and there's challenges. But this is the greatest nation on the earth as far as power. Yes. And, and just their ability to just wipe across land and just take whatever they want. So what are, what are some of the challenges, the, the literal challenges that he would face as a young man in this nation? You know, it's, it's interesting. What he would face is really sort of common to all. It's what is the same thing that young people face today. He would face materialism. Babylon was fabulously wealthy. That's right. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it focused on that. And their, their wealth was really unparalleled certainly on earth at the time of its dominance because all of the lands they conquered they took the wealth of those nations it was theirs now and so there's that particular temptation not just with the uh, with the material things it, itself but there's the the luxury that it offered you know we you look at uh, at the city of babylon itself and it was for its day it was very much a modern city. Maybe had some things that Daniel hadn't seen before. That's right. But uh, he wasn't going to be tempted by that. Yeah, so materialism is, yeah. is a huge issue for him. Yeah, and again, you know, he's, he's in the king's court now. So he's in the highest echelon. He's, he's with the powerful. And we know, as we'll study later on in the book, that he's going to uh, attain... Um, pretty high position himself and that will offer temptation and so uh, again that doesn't tempt him to compromise he's still devoted to God that's amazing because power usually gets us to do all kinds of things to have it to hold on to it because once you're exposed to it and as you said he is a man of great power you get into chapter 6 I think there's like 120 satraps or something. Mm -hmm. And there's three senators or governors over them. Right. Daniel's one of those three. Yeah. I mean, you can't get any more powerful than that. It never gets to his head. It's very much like the old saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> and usually that's true, but not in Daniel's case. Yeah. Because he was always humble enough to submit to God's will, to yeah. do what God said, to put God first. And that's really, I think, a key to overcoming any temptation. Of course it is. Absolutely. And so materialism, he's dealing mm -hmm. with that. He's dealing with the power, absolute power that's been given to him. Anything else that would confront him? The temptation of fornication, sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. That was just an inherent part of, I think, every idolatrous religion. And in... in Babylon, it was, you know, you think about Babylon. Babylon is used in other places in the Bible, in the New Testament, to sort of depict immorality and, and a corrupt city, a corrupt place. And there's a reason for that. 
because it was all of those things. Mm. And it's all right in front of him. And again, as a person with power, you the temptation's stronger because you can take, with fornication as an example, you can just take that and do what you want with it. You're a, you're a man of great power and a great nation. And again, we see no hint of that with Daniel right. throughout the book. Right. There, there are certain gods that they worshipped, and there were many gods. It, of course, wasn't just one. And one of them was uh, Ishtar, and Ishtar was worshipped with sacrifice and fornication. That's right. And that concept carries through to even in the New Testament times with some of the uh, some of the idolatrous religions that existed when Christ came and when the church was established. So these are things that continue to be a temptation for mankind and for young people. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up Ishtar because the, this, the worship of this God would be introduced to him, and he so he becomes aware of it. And then all the facets of that is blatantly obvious with the festivals they would have in certain times, certain moons, however they mm -hmm. celebrate this God. or, And like you said, it's a time of just blatant fornication, that this is part of what this God wants from us. So it, you know, it's not fair for us to just say, oh, there was a God and he existed, and so Daniel may have seen him. No, he is he's part of this society now, and it is being pushed on him. Yes. Just like our kids, or just like you and I, there's this question, oh, you don't do that? You haven't tried that? Oh, man, it's great. You know, you, you don't know what you're missing. That's exactly how this is introduced to him because that's how the devil works, isn't it? Yes, and that was part of his training and education <laughs> for this new land that he was in. That's right. He needed to learn. This is what we do, yeah. and you're going to accept it. At least to pass the test, you got to put the right answer on the sheet, right? <laughs> that, right. That's how right. it works. And so doesn't that, doesn't that tie into the worldly wisdom that they offer? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, as you say, it's the same thing that goes on today uh, with much of education, that there are concepts that are contrary to the Word of God. And for the young Christian, we have to recognize those things and do as Daniel did. You know, they may be taught to us, but that doesn't mean that we have to accept them. That's right. I know other, I know different. I know, mm -hmm. that I know what God has told me. In, in 1 Corinthians 1, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the wickedness of I'm sorry, the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see your calling, brethren. There's not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And that's who he is, and that is always going to be true. Right, right. And Daniel is a living example of that. And our kids can be in school, and we can be at work. Yes. It's just the way it is. Yeah. We need to make a choice. Right. So you can choose the worldly wisdom, which God will turn into absolute foolishness. Or you can choose eternal wisdom from God. Daniel seems to understand that at right. a very deep level. So, so in verse 9, uh, Daniel's got a plan uh, with this new delicacies and wine and stuff that's set before him. Verse 9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies, as you see fit. So deal with your servants." So he consented with him in this matter. That's amazing. And he tested them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away the portion of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Man, what a request to say, right. can I ask a favor? <laughs> That's a foreign kid. Who doesn't want to be defiled? The God's told us that. Yes. That's why he's doing it. He's not being obnoxious and saying, I don't want all of that fancy food. Right. I bet the chances are we actually do want it. Yeah. I bet that was some delicious stuff. But he has a higher calling and he knows it. And the thing about this is that everything is based on his faith. So no matter what decision he was going to make, it was going to be based on his faith. And what I love about this portion is that he has a plan. 
Yeah. He doesn't come up with the plan last second. I don't believe he does. I don't think so either. I think when, when these delicacies were presented to him and he saw that these are contrary to God's will, that he just immediately knew he wasn't going to violate the word of God. And here's what I will do, but I won't do this. That's right. And that's, a, that's again, a very important message for our young people. You're going to face things in school. You're going to face temptations that you need to prepare yourself for before you get there. Amen. This is something I try to tell young people when they uh, either enter into high school or go to college, especially college, because they're going to see things, hear things all around them. That if they, especially you go to a state college, you know, it's, it's not a good environment. It is <laughs> very close to Babylon. That's right. You better be ready for it. Yep. Have a plan. That is such good advice. And, and to do that in advance, I, I heard a preacher say one time that, you know, talking to young people, he said, you know, you're starting to get into where it's like dating or going out and being with a girl for the first time. Do not think that when the, he said, when the windows of your car are fogging up, mm -hmm. don't think that in that moment you'll say, oh, this is wrong. <laughs> right. Because you have, yeah. you have missed everything. It, yes. You make that determination in the beginning. And so you have guidelines in front of you that say, well, I, we probably shouldn't ride together and go there and because we're going to end up alone. Yeah. Let's bring a friend or two and, you know, keep everything above board. And it protects you. And when you make the decisions in advance and with some foresight, you're going to be safe. And you never have to come home to your parents and say, I got some bad news. Right. I've right. made a mistake. That is such, and, and God wants to keep us from that. Yes. That's the, that's why, right? To, for our good. It's for, exactly. It's for our good. God's laws, which the world sees as so restrictive. Mm. The world sees as, oh, you people don't have any fun, which first of all, is totally untrue. That's right. <laughs> and secondly, that you realize that God has given us these restrictions and permission for our benefit, for our good. Yeah, and, and, and it's always been true. So what, one other thing, and as we think about this, was we have to remember what these boys have been through. If, if you mm -hmm. reference 2 Kings 25, 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. So this is before they take Daniel. Yes. And they built a siege wall against it all around. Set for, so the, for the fourth, uh, so the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Again, this is happening before they grab Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they have starved the city out. Yes. There's nothing left in those walls. And that's when they finally take it. And that was typical, too, of nations back in the day. Right. Cut off the water supply, cut off the food supply, and they will give up. Right. So what, what does Daniel look like <laughs> if there's no food when they come in? He's skin and bones. <laughs> and yet at the same time, before they can appear before the king, they have to look healthy. Right. They have to be, you know, properly fed and properly attired and... So and you, you you spend quite a bit of time looking at food and what, what's in food and whether or not mm. it's safe to eat that. So let me just ask you, if you're skin and bones and you eat vegetables, can you get fat? You can. <laughs> really? Oddly enough. Oh, I used man. To, I used to ask that question myself. Okay. But it actually is possible, depending well, on the nature of the vegetables. <laughs> yes. What kind of vegetables would you put more meat on you, make you fill well, out and look good. High carb. So potatoes. Potatoes. Wow. Bread, wheat, you okay. know, those sorts of things. Yeah. I, I was thinking that, you know, obviously God's hands involved. And I believe that as well. Yeah. The, the yes. countenance, that they just look, their skin is cleaner, uh, they're, they're put on weight. More so than the ones who are pigging out on the delicacies. Right. It's amazing. Right. But, yeah, okay, so it's good to know that you can actually gain weight from some particular vegetables. I, I do know some, some vegans, and they do. They actually have trouble <laughs> losing weight because that is interesting. of it is. Okay. It is. And I didn't know that before a few years ago. But I think you're absolutely correct in that God has his hand in it because you look at the result of this. 
as they appear before the uh, the uh, the, uh, the the leader here that's mm-hmm. in charge of them. Yep. That they're better. That's exactly right. Man, that that is that is really a neat thing, and moving through that period of time that you know that he got 10 days to eat this particular kind of food on request and it's, it's being secretly done isn't it because the the guy who runs it said the king's gonna kill me if he finds out I've changed the menu for you yes and so, and that's when Daniel makes the deal let's try 10 days and, and you you decide so he, he still he keeps it in that man's hands he's not trying to take over but he's saying, let's give it a shot. You can you give us 10 days? Right. And the man says, you know what? I'll do that. So I think that says something to us about Daniel as well. Um, he's diplomatic. He's able to speak to a foreign commander and convince him that there'll be no harm in this. We're certainly not going to tell on you. Right. I'm trying right. not to defile myself. And I think it's within that short period where God's hand comes into play. Mm-hmm. That in that short period that they look so much better and so much superior to the others. Yeah, 10 days. Boy, that's not very long. It's not long, no. But it's enough to, to convince them. So, in beginning in verse 17, we, we see how greatly his faith uh, in God is rewarded. It says, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all of his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. And that is Daniel chapter 1, 17 through 21. Ten times better. Yeah. What, what do you think the king was thinking when he was asking these boys questions? Yeah, well, <laughs> interesting, isn't it? But, uh, you know, I think the key part here is verse 17. God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. Yeah. So as they're studying this, God is blessing them. Mm. And he does so because of their refusal to compromise, because of their faith in him. Yeah. So they're going to prosper. And the credit goes where it's due. It goes to God. That's right. And it works out in our lives as well. I, you know, I just I'm I'm trying not to, but I keep going back to the high school student as an example. Yeah, we have one who honors God, who whose parents are honor God. He he or she is raised in a home that cares about um, moral values uh, to the extent of holding them accountable to those things. Yes, this child is not out looking for the next party to go to. He's not, you know, meeting somebody uh, under the stadium stands to to buy something he shouldn't. Uh, his mind is clear. God is still developing his body, his mind, her mind, um, the developmental stages of the brain. I, I think go up into the twenties before it's finally, you know, fully developed, from what I understand. And so that there's no contamination there. And, and, and in that right. process, just as you said, God blesses them because they they have discipline in their life. They, their bodies are clean, and they're they know that when they go to school, they should be paying attention and, and absorbing what they can the very best that they can right. they're just better equipped than the kid who comes dragging in because he watched movies all night and, and you know didn't go to bed till four in the morning and now he's coming to school we know which one's going to be more successful right right but isn't it true that in, in that example I've given that the one whose parents honor God and who is also trying to honor God that he's blessing them in that yes they will have a happier life That's right. as a result of that it's a guarantee Guarantee, absolutely. Sober-minded, thinking clearly, rationally, uh, you know, having parents who have trained you in that in that same way, and then having them as an example. Yes, and then continuing in that faith for the rest of your life. There's a crown of righteousness in the end. <laughs> That's exactly right, and that is promised by God. Yeah. So, was there ever a time when Daniel wasn't faithful? You know, I was thinking about that, and the answer to that is, as far as I know, no. Now, that doesn't mean he was sinless. Right. But uh, he always did the right thing. Yes. Was it Romans 3.23? Um, all men fall short of the glory of God. Yes. Yeah. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. 
And Daniel's in that as well. Yes. Because yes. he needs Jesus just like we do. Right. But he is a stallion when it comes to faith and righteousness and just saying, I can't do that because my God would be displeased. Mm -hmm. And in the greatest conflict and challenge of his life, he's able to, to, to maneuver through that and be faithful to God. Even when there was a price to pay, yeah. whether it's the lion's den or in the case of his free, three friends, the fiery furnace, they weren't going to compromise. Nope. And of course, we know that in the end, that if you live faithfully, there's a great reward beyond comprehension. That's right. And we believe that with all of our heart. Yeah. Man, what an amazing chapter. I want to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we, we, we talked about trivia questions. Yes. Uh -huh. I just want to, I want to share with everyone that I, I mentioned to brother Dan that, uh, you know, we do trivia questions. Kurt and I do each show and I told him that's what we do. I, op I gave him the option to opt out and he, he said, no, he wants to do it. And, so, and I'm not shy about saying, I don't know. Good. Good. You can't be right. No, no point in bluffing. Right. And that's the, that's one of the points that Kurt and I try to make is that if, if I do say I don't know, then I've got homework to do. Right. Because I want to go read it myself, look into it, and say, that's right, I knew that, or however that comes back to me. Yes. But if we're talking about the Bible, then it's worth my time. So yeah. it's yeah. good. You can't lose, really. Right. Even though Kurt and I keep score. <laughs> <laughs> Trivia. Sweet Trivia. I'll let you go first. You said one of them was really tough, okay. and one of them was pretty easy. You thought so. Let, let me hear the first. Well, one. I, I have I have one that you know we've been studying Joseph this week while you're holding our gospel meeting, and this is this is sort of distantly related to Joseph. Okay. How old was Jacob when he met Pharaoh? Hmm. Is this when Pharaoh asked him, where are you from? How old are you? That... Yes. Yes. Oh, and man. that's a, I know that's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's, I have two guesses. I'm going to give you the one I think is most likely. Okay. 110. Close, but not quite. 120. Closer. <laughs> it's more than that? More than that. How old was he? He was 130, and that's Genesis 47 and 9. Wow. Genesis 47 9, 130 uh, years old. 130 years old. First speaks to Pharaoh. Yes. Man, that wasn't even my third guess. I didn't have a third <laughs> guess. That is amazing. The problem with my memory of that is that I I remember him saying, my life's been pitiful and full of anguish. <laughs> you know? Yes. He's like, yes. it sounds so depressed. Right. Which is sad, but uh, yeah. 130. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Here's number one for you and for everyone else. Um, it's from Daniel. Oh. You should ace uh -oh. this. Uh-oh. <laughs> Daniel was saved by God from the lion's den, which, which we mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, what did the lions uh, end up getting to eat for dinner that day? It wasn't Daniel. No. It was the people who put him there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Daniel 6 and verse 24 tells us the governors and the satraps who accused Daniel and their children yes. were thrown into the den. And it says that the lions crushed their bones before they even hit the bottom. Yeah. And I, I think the Lord gives us that because it shows how hungry those giant cats were. Right. Because, you know, the, the person who's a skeptic would say, well, maybe they just ate. Because lions don't just keep eating. You know, once once they're full, they lay around. Yeah. Because that's what they did with Daniel. But when you see him come out, they go in and those lions just eat up every last one of them. There was more than one lion and they were hungry, obviously. Yeah. So yeah. I think that is amazing. Again, God absolutely involved. Right. Daniel's not a lion tamer. Right. He's just a servant. Yeah. It's really a cool thing. And God's watching out for him because of that faith. Yeah, that's right. Lions kept their mouths shut. Yeah. All right, what's the second one for me? Number two, uh, who moved the stone from Jesus' tomb? It wasn't the Roman soldiers. No, it wasn't <laughs> them. Uh, it was an angel of the Lord. Yes, it was an angel. That's Matthew 28 and verse 2. Very good. All right. I feel better now that I got one right. <laughs> 
Final question. Okay. You ready? ready? Here we go. Ready. Zacchaeus wanted to see the Lord, but he couldn't see over the crowd because he was short in stature. How did he fix that problem? He climbed a sycamore tree. That's right. And that's funny you should ask that question because I almost asked the same one. No way. Yeah. Really? I was going to ask, what tree did Zacchaeus climb? <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool because the Bible's got a lot of information in it. And yeah. you and I were on the same page. All right. So you inadvertently cheated. because you, Inadvertently. Yes. Yeah. You, you yeah. could not have known. Um, yeah, it says that he ran ahead. I mean, you think about the crowd and he's... You know, trying to get his head up, and he, he says, "I'm not going to be able to see the Lord." His excitement about Jesus being in town kind of, kind of makes me think a little bit. And then he knows what direction Jesus is going. Uh -huh. So he says he runs ahead, climbs the sycamore tree because he knew the Lord would pass that way. And nothing was going to stop him. You get that sense he was going to see the Lord. That's right. Nothing was going to stop him. And how does that translate for us when nothing's going to stop you from doing? what you want to do to benefit God or to, you know, to That's, be the Lord, see the Lord. Yes, absolutely. We need to have that same determination. Yes, sir. I love that. That is really neat. He was a wee little man, as the song says. Yes. Very good. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with me today and, and going through Daniel chapter one. It's been amazing. Well, I've enjoyed it. Good. I enjoyed it very much. I'm always glad when that goes both ways, because I really do appreciate it. And uh, obviously the time you spent in the book, the teaching that you've done through the years is a great benefit to us. Well, I, I've one of my favorite books, as I've said. Awesome. It's a wonderful book. Well, this is Brother Dan Gatlin, and if uh, you ever have an opportunity, you're in the city of Kerrville, which is a beautiful place, by the way. Mm -hmm. But if you're ever in the city of Kerrville and you're here on a Wednesday or a Sunday, stop on in and say hello to Brother Dan Gatlin at Junction Highway Church of Christ. Uh, as always, we want you to go out, serve God with all of your heart, uh, have your heart and your mind, your soul devoted to him. Make those decisions that you know would be pleasing in his sight, and he'll see you through. He's shown us over and over again that that is who he is. Have a blessed day.